I started becoming an established drug dealer in the city. People would see me, they would know who I was from different neighborhoods, and I was able to raise young boys up, and everybody around me started getting money. So now I'm not just the one dude getting money, Everybody got money. So I'm driving down the street. I had the hard top up and I'm just driving down the street, you know, man, I'm just listening to beats and I'm about to drop them off. I pull up to his house and when I pull up to his house, shots just ring out. Pop, 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 pop. 10 shots go through my Lexus. And it's a convertible, it's no bigger than this little area that I'm in like right here. The first thing I said is, God, don't let me die like this. And I remember like, I never felt love like this in my life. I felt this overwhelming peace, overwhelming love overwhelming sensation just start coming over me and I just did not know what I was like yo what is going on? I just started crying I'm like yo what is going on with me ain't nobody around me I'm like oh my god what is going on around what is going on with me so growing up in Baltimore um I didn't know how bad it was because I was in it and it became like the norm so uh we grew up in the projects in East Baltimore called High on the Ridge all I ever seen was drugs, guns, you know. Um, I seen um, men beat my mom up. All I ever seen was just like shootouts and, and people actually getting to getting to the money. When it came down to like growing up in it and then it being hard, you really ain't know what it was hard because that was all we ever seen. I remember um, looking out my window every night and watching drug dealers sell drugs all day long and watch them get money, watch their cars pull up, and I'll be like, man, them cars icy. And I'll be like, man, I'll be, I know what's going on. I'll be watching the place. I know where people's guns was at because I'll watch them stash their guns. I'll watch where people's drugs is at because I'll watch them do this. And I was consistently consumed with just every single day watching them, you know, do this thing every day. And I I remember one day I was actually going to the um going to school one day. My mother used to keep me clean. And um, so I, used to, I was going to school one day, and um, I had my little trench coat on. I was right up walking up the street, and I went, and I was on a bus stop, and I felt the dead body, like, laying in the dumpster. And I was looking like, yo, that's a real dead body. And you would think I was scared, but it was almost like I was interested, like, yo, that's a dead body. And then, you know, obviously, from there, we still went to school, and they was expecting me to function. So uh, I remember when the projects got shut down, they, they shut the projects down, and um, everybody had to move out. And at this point, life shaped me and conditioned me into who I was, like fighting in the projects, being always, you know, always in some, some, some kind of violence, always just wanting to feel important. I felt important, but I wanted to like, I wanted other people to know that I was important. So what happened was when we moved to this neighborhood in South Baltimore, and I was like, man, you know, I'm new around here, you know, all right, cool. I come from this place, so you always want to rep where you from when you coming to wherever you from. Like in Baltimore, you like, look, I moved around here, but I'm from over East Baltimore, so like, don't play with me, y'all. Y'all know, like, I ain't, I ain't like y'all. And um, I'm from the projects. This a hood, but I'm from the projects, so we moved around there. I started, you know, dibbling, dabbing, and I started like getting pounds of weed, going to school, taking school, taking weed to school with me in my book bag, and I, and I stopped actually going to class, and I just stopped instantly, just stopped going to school. Period. I would just uh, every day hook school. I would see so many different people around the neighborhood, and I felt like they wasn't strong enough to hold what they had down. And I was like, man, I'm, I, I feel like I'm, I can do this. Like I feel like I can come out here and take this over. And I was feeling like this for a minute, and I would watch this one dude, and I would see this dude. He would come out, and he would just be, just, be, just pull up on blocks and just start shooting at people, and and people were scared of him. And then he liked me. He was like, man, what's up, little homie? I'm like, man, what's up, man? He was like, man, listen. He like, you want, you want, you want, you want to kick away? I'm like, man, I, 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 man, I love to hang with you, man. And um, one day, um, I actually was just seeing him just bullying the neighborhood and really just moving in authority. And I was like, man, I want that. I said, I want that. And um, he instantly, one, one day, he ended up getting locked up. He had to, he went away for a while. And then I was like, man, you know, wasn't nothing going on. And I was just like, man, I, you know, we gotta find a plug, man. I told one of my homeboys, and we found a plug. And then instantly, um, I started separating different people in different in different parts of the neighborhood, and I, I established my own crew. And I started telling people like, "Look here, man, we out here now. Y'all can't come down here. This is our neighborhood at this point." And we started moving in authority. Started moving with that same muscle I was seeing. Started duplicating what I was learning from the projects and what I was learning from the homie who was living in that neighborhood before me. I started really duplicating, it. and I was like, "Man, listen, we shutting this thing down." And then next thing you know, I became somebody that I never thought I would ever be. Somebody who just, and sometimes I just was like, man, I, I knew, I seen it in my projects out my window, but I never knew this was going to be me. 
I started really getting selling a lot of drugs and I became really good at it. And I was able to distinguish who was good with money, who was who can be muscle. And I was able to take people, take kids, even young boys out of their parents' houses and be able to like use them for their strengths for my own selfish benefit. And um, a lot of people died in the midst of this, like like lost their life. Um, I remember actually like being outside one of my homeboys and um, just leaving him. I just bought a brand new Acura TL. You know, I was like, you know, I, that was a doctor lawyer card that time. I was just like, you know, you know, always jewelry, always, you know, just a, a lot of money on me. I had just left him. And then somebody pulled up on him and just shot him in the head with a shotgun. I still remember to this day, like, you know, we was like, you know, doing the same old, you know, normal stuff. Just we put alcohol bottles up there. We up there, you know, crying, listening to music and stuff like that. Thinking like, man, whoever did this, we going to kill him. We we gonna we gonna we gonna kill him. Um, who you know what I mean? Who 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 could do this to my homie? Like, not realizing what kind of stuff that we was in. And then later on, this was the life we was in. So I was just like, man, this is this just what it is. Like, this what it is. This just what it is. This this this, this the life we we signed up for. I felt like I couldn't get out. I felt like I had to be what I was. I felt like I was just so deep into the too neat deep in the streets that um. It was nowhere else for me to go. The money was coming. You know, I could have any girl I wanted. I had the respect, not just in my in my neighborhood, but in the city at this time. I started becoming an established drug dealer in the city. People would see me. They would know who I was from different neighborhoods by the streets talking. Um, and I was able to raise young boys up. And everybody around me started getting money. So now I'm not just the one dude getting money. Everybody got money. I end up getting a bigger bigger cars, having five or six cars at one time, having a really big, expensive Mercedes Benz. And I was a baby driving these cars. And um, I would pull up the doctors and lawyers and look at them and like, with a mouth full of gold teeth in my mouth, diamonds all in my mouth, just looking at them like, I'm doing the same thing you're doing. You getting money, I'm getting money. It don't make a difference. And I felt like, regardless, like so powerful. And the whole neighborhood respected me. Everybody respected me. Um, to the point where it's though. I started like taking advantage of it, start selling weight to like, you know, like people who was way older than me. I'm a, I'm like barely 20, 20, 20 years old. I'm selling drugs to, you know, grown, I feel like 30, 35 year old men, 40 year old men, they coming to me, I'm their plug. And I'm like, man, I'm feeling like, you know, like now uh, I, I hear these rappers talking this stuff, you know what I'm saying? But they talking this stuff, but I really live this stuff. I was like, man, I like, like these dudes lying about, they talking this stuff on their song, but it's really my life. And I, I felt like I felt proud about who I was becoming at, at times. But then it sometimes I felt like disgusted about it as well, because I recognized I was, you know, a lot of people around me was dying. And um, I felt like I had a big responsibility for what was happening with these people's lives because um, I was involved. You know, even though they made their own choice to be involved, but I know like what I was giving them, what I was telling them to do. And then if things didn't go the way it was going, and somebody lost their life, I numb myself by saying, man, this is what it is. But at the end of the day, just looking in the mirror, like, yo, that was really your fault, bro. You know what I'm saying? And I see that all the time. Can you tell me about once you started to see these rappers and their lifestyle, how that kind of pulled you into that as well? I can remember um, one of my homies saying, like, bro, you hear these rappers from Baltimore, bro? They rapping. You hear them? Because we was really big into, like, truth even if it was a, like even if you was living a lie our own truth i would say if that makes sense if you was on a microphone and you was lying about your life you would get called out on it you was bluffing that's what pretty much we're saying baltimore man homie bluffing he ain't, he, ain't, he ain't really about that and um i remember um i would actually i was actually um listening to some music on the radio one day and the dude was just lying and my homie was like bro won't you do this and i'm like Man, I ain't no rapper, homie. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a street, I'm a street dude. I'm a street dude. That's what I did. I, mean, I, I get to. I ain't, I ain't no rapper. Let them do this. My homie, my bro, my, my homie was like, bro, I seen you freestyle. You was just, I seen you play around with it, bro. Your hooks be hard. And I was like, man, I know, bro. Like, you know what I mean? So then one day I just was like, man, let's go to the studio, bro. Like, and I started getting on the microphone and I started talking about what I was doing, and people knew it was real in the city, and they was like, yo, live, man, you speaking to me, you preaching to me, you preaching to me, this is what I'm doing, this is what I'm doing, and I was like, oh, man, I got something. And I was like, I got something that's gonna kinda make me take me out the streets, that's gonna kinda like, you know what I mean, that's gonna make, you know, get us out the streets, and I talked to my homie Mitch, I'm like, bro, 
I, like, 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 let's start taking this a little bit more serious. And um, he was like, yeah, I think you need to start. So I started, you know, putting out projects. I put out a project and did my, my whole hood went crazy. And I think, you know, um, my music really started exposing, you know, a lot of the fake stuff that was going on with, on the Baltimore scene. It got really crazy because um, I became this drug dealer in the streets who had beef, who was robbing, going crazy, all wild stuff, like getting like ridiculously. Now I'm starting to rap and now social media is a thing that you gotta do being a rapper. And now I'm, I'm rapping and I'm in the studio with nothing but killers. Cause at this time, now I'm rapping, it's more rappers who coming up under me cause I'm expiring rappers. And you know, they coming from different places. So everybody now, now, now fake rappers is out of there. All real drug dealers is rappers now. So I'm in the studio with some of the biggest rappers in Baltimore at this time. And I'm one of them as well. And um, I don't know if I can say anybody's name, but one of the homies, his name Lord Scooter, he from Baltimore. At this time, he is so hot, and his music is jumping so crazy. Um, and me and him do a track together. That track is blowing up. Um, I, I'm on a song with dudes like YG Tech from Baltimore, and he's the biggest rapper in Baltimore right now. I actually just prayed for him recently, and he put it in the song, As a Man of God and everything. I'm in the studio with all these killers, and I can just, I'm like, man, something ain't right. I'm like, man, I don't know, yo. I'm like, yo, something ain't right. And I go right in the studio, because I never wrote music. I just, you know, just straight express what's on my heart. And I and I wrote a song, You Wanna Gamble? Better roll a seven. That's a Mac 11. F your revin. Amen. And I was like, yo, where'd that come from? And I was like, chop but sing real loud like a choir. Now you wanna be saved? Asking people come pray for you? Chop but sing real loud like a choir. And I was like, yo. But later on, I'm like, you know, I kind of like realized that I was, I needed deliverance. Like it was crazy. But in that atmosphere, it was nothing but killers. I mean, when I say in Baltimore, like when I say I was around it, you know how somebody could say, I'm, a, I'm the dude in New York. I'm around the people in New York. I was around the people in Baltimore. I was a part of that thing. You know what I'm saying? When you hear Baltimore, you can say that. So tell me, Aaron, about when Jesus began to tug on your heart. What did that look like for you? I remember I was in the studio making music, get back in the studio. I'm about to drop Neighborhood Superstar, about to drop this project, the whole street's waiting for it. So I'm in the studio on social media real time. I leave the studio. I had, at this time I had a convertible Lexus drop top and I'm, I put my, my producer, I'm taking him home. So I'm driving down the street. I had the hard top up and I'm just driving down the street, you know, man, I'm just listening to beats and I'm about to drop him off. I pull up to his house and when I pull up to his house, Shots just ring out. Pop, 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 pop. Ten shots go through my Lexus. And it's a convertible. It's no bigger than this little area that I'm in, like, right here. And I'm like, the first thing I said is, God, don't let me die like this. I threw my homeboy head down, and I jumped on top of him because I did not, let, I could not allow him to die. And I threw his head down, and I laid on top of him, and the shots just kept ringing. And next thing you know, I, um, I woke up um, in the hospital in handcuffs shot. And I remember me saying, God, don't let me die like this. But when I woke up in the hospital shot and I was alive, I was like, yeah, I was the realest drug dealer in Baltimore City. I really lived this life all the way to the fullest. And I got shot and lived. I'm really about to turn up with this music. They really about to see what's up with me. And whoever did this going to die. And I'm like, but I'm handcuffed to a bed. And I'm like, I got wants and I don't even know nothing about. So they locked me up and then, you know, I had to get released in the hospital on my own recon. Pretty much they just got to take the handcuffs off me. And the police officer was like, I could not leave you, man. I don't know what it is about you, man, but I could not leave you, man. I was like, man, you ain't getting no test. You ain't getting nothing out of me, man. So you might as well just dip. And he was like, man, but I, I said, but I like you though, bro. But you know, you might as well roll out. All my homeboys come in there talking. And then my dad actually walked into this. And, then, and I was like, bro, if you don't get up out of here, you see these killers around me? You see these real dudes around me? I said, and I, I raised them. And I was like, you ain't nothing, man. Get up out of here. I'm just sitting in the hospital. And I felt like, you know, felt, I had to breathe. My lungs collapsed. I seen a person who got shot in the same exact spot I got shot in. Couldn't walk no more. And I was like, I seen all this stuff in the hospital. I was just in there. And I remember this, this amazing lady. I went back to try to find her. It was a nurse. And she cleaned me up and she was sing over me. And she was like, baby, you mind if I pray for you? I was like, go ahead. <laughs> I need it. Like, pray for me. And she started, so she started cleaning me. She was like, do you know how much Jesus loves you? 
I said, I know you love me. I know you love me. I'm like, she was like, baby, he love you. He got a purpose for your life. I said, thank you so much. I mean, that means so much to me. Like, and she prayed for me. Can you love I pray for you? She prayed for me. And I remember crying like, man, that was so good. And next thing you know, I get out the hospital with staples in my stomach all the way up to the top of my stomach because they had to cut me open to get the bullet out. I um, went home and I remember my father-in-law who was a Jehovah Witness picked me up. He was like, Jehovah wouldn't have let me get shot like that. And I was like, shut up. <laughs> I'm like, man, shut up, man, take me home. Went home without no medication. Ain't realized that I was drugged up the whole time. I was crying on the floor, just in so much pain. Ended up finally getting my medication, started healing up, started getting better. Went right back outside, staples in my stomach, got a rental car right back to trapping. Drop neighborhood superstar. I was becoming one of the hottest rappers in Baltimore City at this time. Every hot rapper to this day that's really hot in my city right now was on this project. And I'm like, and really about to turn up. My homeboy signed the future. My homeboy uh, signed the future at this time. So we got so many things working for us where it's throwing my music really in position, like, you know what I mean, to go. So I'm like, yeah, you know, same old thing. I'm back in the streets trying to figure out who killed me on, you know what I mean, making diss tracks about whoever was did it. I get to running, get to running crazy back in the streets, real crazy again, still robbing, still, you know, acting crazy, still cheating, still doing everything I was doing. And then we in a club one night. I'm with my homies, and we, you know, same old thing, whole lot of money spent. And we got these CHM free band gang chains on. And I like, man, like, you know, for some reason I'm in DC, I'm like, bro, I don't belong here. And one of my homies like, what you mean? Like, I'm like, bro, he like, bro, look at this club, look what we doing. I'm like, bro, you got like $200,000 worth of jewelry on. Here, just take this chain to add this to the collection. I'm about to go home, man. I'm ready to get out of here. I don't feel like I belong here. And, you know, I ain't drink nothing that night or nothing. He was like, all right, bro, like, love you, man. I'm like, all right, love you. I'm driving home. And I'm like, man, I'm just like, I don't know what's going on with me. <laughs> what's going on with me? And I, I finally, um, I get to my house. And I um, go in the house, and my wife come out. It's 5 o'clock in the morning. She's like, it's the same old thing. 5 o'clock in the morning. You coming in here this time of morning, and, and you acting like like, no, like, like like you can do whatever you want. I want out of this marriage. I'm like, girl, you ain't going to never find nobody slick as me. Like, cause I'm talking crazy. You ain't never going to find nothing like me in your life. Prideful, so arrogant. Like, And I sat on the couch, and I remember, like, I never felt love like this in my life. I felt this overwhelming peace overwhelming love, overwhelming sensation just start coming over me. And I just did not know what, I was like, yo, what is going on? I just started crying. I'm like, yo, what is going on with me? Ain't nobody around me. I'm like, oh my God, what is going on around, what is going on with me? I'm like, look on, as soon as I open my phone, I open my phone as a pastor on my phone. And he started talking about the love of God. And I was like, this is what I'm feeling right now, at the moment right now. I was like, yo, I just started crying. Just started crying, just started crying. I ain't had no, I'm like, I need a Bible. I, I got a Bible, but the only Bible I had in my house was a Jehovah Witness Bible. Because <laughs> my wife was a Jehovah Witness. So I was like, ah. And I was just like, you know, I just started, I just had the earphones on walking around the house. So a day go past, I'm still in the Word. Two, three days go past, I'm still in the Word. My wife thought I was just trying to get good time in because I was, you know, thought I was out at like five o'clock in the morning again. She thought I was just trying to make her feel good, but I was actually having an encounter with Jesus. I remember just cleaning the house all the time and just still got my earphones on. So she came home, it was like five days later, and I'm still in the house every single day. I'm starting to pray. I, I, I'm starting to like really read. I, I'm like, why do I understand the Bible now? I got a Bible. Why do I understand the Bible now? Why, why am I just comparing Jesus to my life? And I'm like, yo, what is going on with me? And I'm just like, and instantly out of nowhere, my wife noticed that I wasn't cussing no more. And she noticed why I'm in there. She's like, why are you in the house? I didn't know how to tell her, but she's like, why you ain't cussing no more? Every time I come home, it's clean. I'm like, and what's going on with you? I'm like, uh -huh. I'm just like, I don't know what's going on with me. I'm just like, you know, I'm a better person. Like, because she's your whole witness. How am I tell her that I experienced Jesus when they never experienced Jesus before? And I know this is Jesus because he told me it was him. At this time, I'm just like, man, I'm so in love. I'm in the house. And then one day, it's like one day she come out the house, come out, come out the bedroom, and she see me drenched in tears 4.30 in the morning. And she was like, what is going on with you? And she really knew that it was real. She knew that I really had an encounter with Jesus, but she was like, I don't care what your encounter was like. Like, you won't change me. And I was like, I, I'm not trying to change you, but all I can tell you is, like, I know Jesus. And what happened was 
I would just shut down everything. I, I never, I couldn't go back outside no more. I would start taking walks with the Lord. I would start, you know, believing I could walk on water. I was, I was in like, yeah, you said I could do this. And, and I became this overwhelming love bomb to the point where as though my wife was the good person in our relationship to the point where as though when she would come home now, everything about her life was exposed because I was the light. And being this evil, dark person all the time, being this wicked person, I became the light. No more rap music. Threw all my CDs out, all the porn out, everything that was in that house that was wicked, everything out. And now, you know, uh, she wanted to like try to like have a conversation and like a natural conversation and I didn't know how to have one. Everything was God, 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 God. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And it's like, Oh, barely, you know, it was like no time in. And she like, you extreme. You was an extreme drug dealer. Now you an extreme Jesus freak. I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm in love. And she was like, oh, my goodness. you just too much. And um, I would spend so much quality time with Jesus that I was just like, I thought I was the only Christian because I never seen nobody who was like me before. And I never seen because I, I knew my own life. I knew that I didn't cuss no more, lie no more, steal no more. All I wanted was the best for everybody. All I wanted to see people to experience what I was experiencing. I knew this about myself. And I never seen this life in no one else. And um, I would pray and God would instantly answer all of my prayers. And pray here, instantly answer. Pray. Then I was like, well, Jesus, how am I? You know what I'm gonna do for money? Like, uh, you know what I mean? I was a drug dealer. I ain't got no, I don't got no experience, no with no work. And he put on my heart to start this painting business because I used to, you know, paint with my uncle when I was little. And I actually, you know, learned how to do it in some trade school one time. And um, I started a painting business right in my living room. And then he just blessed that, instantly blessed that. And I was able to like, you know, make finances through that. So it was just like overwhelming. And I would see things in my life walking out before I would even read it in the Bible. It's just like me being with somebody every day, I'm picking up their ways because we around each other. I was with Jesus so much that I would later on read something in the scripture that I was already doing because I was just so deep in communion with him. And I would see it all the time. And I was like, oh my God, I need somebody to talk to. I ain't had nobody. It was just me and Jesus all the time. And I once still ran into one of my homies who actually one time, me and him, I, I felt like I wanted to kill him. I did want to take him out. And um, I seen him in a barber shop, and I was like, yo, he was talking to the barber man about Jesus. I was like, yo, he having this encounter too. He going through this too. So I was like, I, I got to talk to him. So I talked to him, and I remember me and him talking, and we, we became, he was the first person I fellowship with. We became really close, and when I couldn't talk to him, I would go crazy because I needed somebody to talk to about this revelation I was getting, all this experiences I was having. I would let, because my wife, she wasn't trying to hear nothing. She was just like, don't talk to me about that. Don't talk to me about that stuff. It was overwhelming to her. And I remember um, um, he was like, I, I ended up talking to my homie when I, whenever he could talk to me. He's like, man, you need to go to this church, man. I was like, bro, check this out. We ain't going to no churches. They not real. They not like us. I think we the only ones. He was like, bro, just go to the church, bro. I was like, man, and I, and I asked the Lord, the Lord was like, go to the church. I went to the church, and the pastor was super transparent. He was real. The Lord accelerated me so fast in the church, I'm, and, my, and I would instantly start crying because I realized there were so many people who was actually going to church and didn't know Jesus. And I was, I would just instantly start crying. Like I would, I would have intense intercession moments, like crying out for these people. I was like, man, he, and, and the Lord was like, this is why I have you here. And um, so he started a men's group. And, um, and this church was like a thousand people, 1,200 people in the church. And I've never seen no men barely had their hands up worshiping. And I was alone with Jesus. So I took my intimate time with Jesus to the church. I'm this drug dealer. You know what I mean? I'm like with my hands up running through the church like, ah, thank you, God. Like you are what? I was like, yo, I cannot believe I can know you. I cannot believe I'm experiencing you. And they, these dudes looking at me like, so when I connected with the men, I was like, bro. I need every last one of y'all, the same authority that I had in the streets. I looked at them, I was like, bro, I need every last one of y'all at the front of the altar with y'all hands up. And then instantly, the pastor seen something different that he never seen in the church before. You had 60, 70, 80 men walking in the front of the church with their hands up, with the women behind them. And the wives was like, what is going on in these Monday night meetings? We had Muslims coming to our, 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 our Monday night meetings. So many different people started coming from different places just to come to our Monday night fellowships. And the pastor was like, he would be like, I don't know what God is doing, but you ain't never seen no church with a whole bunch of men walking the altar, hands up, ready to do, ready to serve like this. 
And from there, it just started getting more and more crazy and intense. It just got crazy and intense. So, Aaron, how did the people around you react to your life completely changing? You had all of these people that followed you into the drug game, yeah. and now you left. What did that look like? <sighs> um, It was hard for um my homeboy, Tester, when I said he got signed with Future. It was hard for him because we did so much stuff together, like a lot of wrong stuff, you know. And it, it looked like I felt like he really loved me, like— so it was hard because I was also like the muscle in the street too. So like a lot of people moved around because they was with me. It was hard for him. It was hard um, for, for a lot of people. It was hard from even my mom, I, I would say at times, because it was certain conversations that she would want to have that I would like, you know, tell her like, nah, like, you know, try to correct it. And not in a disrespectful way, but try to line her up with my thinking now and stuff like that. So it was really, really hard for people to like understand like what it was like because they never actually experienced somebody who was actually walking with Christ like that, so close up personal. A lot of my homeboys was like, man, they really believed it because they was like, bro, whatever's going on, because they could see the difference in my face. They could see the conviction in my life. They could see everything. And they was like, well, whatever's going on with you, man, I'm happy for you, but man, you know, that's your life. And my homie Tess actually confessed Christ as Lord, but his life just not bearing it, but I'm still believing for him. But it was, it was challenging. It was challenging for a lot of people because you know, a lot of people haven't never seen nothing like that before. Somebody who really had a, not just a prayer, but a really encounter. Somebody who had a, really had an encounter with the Lord himself. It was tough because it was like just sharing so much light on the life that they was living. Now, Aaron, I know that the Lord began to redeem things in your life, including your relationships. Can you tell us a little bit about how the Lord began to redeem and restore your marriage? Mm. My wife actually had front row seat to actually see Christ in her life. So she could not run. Her plan was, before I had before I had an encounter with the Lord, was that next year to leave me. She had already said that in her heart. She would tell her mother and everybody would be like, don't follow him, don't do nothing like that. And she was like, well, I'm actually enjoying this person that he is. The other stuff, it, it is kind of intense and it is real for him and I see change. And then what happened was, I consistently was just like, it never stopped. She would see me, he was trying to get a house one time. She would see me pray about the situation and she would see God instantly answer. She would say, babe, pray for my passport. Pray that I find my passport. I would say, Holy Spirit, where's the passport? And I was like, we gotta go downstairs and get the passport. It's downstairs somewhere and we'll find a passport. So I was like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, so God was just showing up like that. And um, so she was actually like, told her mom one day, she had told her mom, like, to be honest, Ma, I live with Aaron. And I've never seen a walking image of Christ in my life. I live with this man. And she's like, like you know, she's, she was struggling with still trying to like live her old, like live her life because my life was just, you know, shining so strong. And um, one day, you know, I was like, man, I need all my brothers and sisters to come over my house who I, who I was fellowshipping with. And we, she came home one day and we just cooked a big meal for her. And just loving on, and I allowed her to meet, you know, people who I was fellowshipping with. And she was like, man, they so nice and loving. I ain't never seen nothing like this. So she seen it was more than just me like this. And then she was like, I was like, you know, you come fellowship, go to come to church with us. She's like, nah, nah. But she knew it was real. She said, but I do know what's happening with your life is real. And then one day she just broke down. I was like, baby, I, 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 this is what I want to do. I want, I want to follow Christ. I want, I want what you got. And I was like, yo, people said you can never win at Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I said that in my heart. And she actually repented and she gave her life to Christ. She actually, you know, and she, I'm, I'm telling you, a fire torch. And, um, you know, and um, her uh, uterus was actually turned the opposite way. And um, when she gave her life to Christ, we started actually pursuing having a baby again. We kept getting words that we're going to have a baby. We're going to have a baby. And I'm like, oh, man, like. You know, it just ain't happening. So she was like, let's go to the to the doctor again. I was like, nah, I ain't going to no doctor. I seen God do all this. Look at me. He changed me. He can make a baby. And she was like, let's go to the doctor. So I yielded to her. And I was like, you know, I was trying to have understanding, dwell with her with understanding. And I was trying to kick it with her like like that. And, and it didn't happen. And it, it didn't happen when we, we went through the whole process. It didn't happen. We actually had to drive from Baltimore to Rockville like three times a week for her to get shots in her stomach to try to have this baby and all this other stuff. And I'm like, and it didn't happen. And when she told me, she was like, baby, I don't feel pregnant. And I was like, I got on my knees and I just lifted my hands. I said, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And she looked at me like, what's wrong with you? Why you? I said, like, have your way. 
And then instantly, like I would say, maybe like two months later, we was worshiping. We was praying in tongues. And I was just like laying my hands on her, just like believing in faith. And we was just worshiping. I was just praying in tongues. And I was like, man, God, you're going to do this. This is who you are. A couple weeks later after that like moment, like a couple weeks, I guess when, they, when women know they're going to be pregnant, she was like, babe, came home. And she was like, um, I had came home from church. She was already home. And she had this like letter right in front of the computer, like roses are red, violets are blue. I'm having a baby and a father is you. And the same way I dropped on my knees when God didn't do it that way, I dropped on my knees the same way when he did it his way. And um, she was just crying. I was crying. He actually three years old. His name Lord Bryson. And God did it his way. He redeemed that. Amen. So can you tell me a little bit about your life now? What is it that the Lord has called you into since he saved you and kind of cleaned you up? So I, I started rapping. I've been rapping you know, in the world. But um, what happened was I didn't even know how to rap for the Lord. I was like, rap for Jesus. I ain't going to do that. And I, I would hear different Christian rapping. I was like, man, they can, they can really express their heart for the Lord. And I was like, I ain't rapping. You know, my homeboy was like, man, just go to the studio and make one song. I was like, nah, bro, I can't rap for Jesus. The only thing I can do is just tell people about him the best way I know how. And he was like, man, go to the studio, man, and make one song. And I made one song. And the Lord really just touched it, and it just started reaching, and people in my church, I started getting radio interviews. Next thing you know, I got people coming around asking me, can they manage me? And I'm like, man, and next thing you know, um, I became um, a kingdom artist. I became, um, uh, um, God started using me to minister through music. You know, I started like, you know, I still knew how to make things happen music-wise. So I started really getting the opportunity to, um, to go into secular clubs. I was on secular events with superstar rappers. And I would go into the clubs with microphones. And I'm like, I come in here in the name of Jesus and seen the whole club just back up. They smoking weed, they drinking. And I lay hands, a devil come out of the girl at the altar in the middle of a hip hop event that's, that's a secular event. And they smoking and drinking. And I was like, man. And I'm in there I'm lifting up Jesus. And then people just coming to get prayer after that. They were like, I ain't never seen no Christian do that. Nothing like that. So I was experiencing stuff like that because I was still like, you know, I'm a brand new creation in Christ Jesus, but I still understood the culture. And I was able to go in there and minister to people. And I would find Christians who, who was actually in them places for the wrong reason would come up to me and say, bro, how did you just do that? How did that just happen? Like, like, bro, I'm like, bro, who are you? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in Christ too. I'm like, oh, all right, what's up? <laughs> and they like, man, like, man, I'm like, bro, like, you know, like, this is what we call it too. Like, you ain't got to try to be nobody else. God made you apart from sin for his glory. He wants you to go live for him. Like, if you went here, be, let him use you. But don't be in here fellowshipping with darkness. And like, man, and I see a lot of um, believers who start shifting their perspective on, you know, you know, their life and start evaluating their life. And um, so I would start moving more in the secular around. I didn't instantly start, like, moving in Christian, like, hip-hop. I started moving in a lot of uh, dark places. God was taking me right back to them places. And I would see so many people get give their life to Jesus. And um, and I realized that the music he was allowing me to make was reaching the streets and not like, like and, and it was touching the church people, but it was reaching the streets. And I was like, yo, this is crazy. And everybody started calling me spiritual plug. It was like, man, you spiritual plug, bro. You plugging people into Jesus, bro. Like, and drug dealers was like, yo, bro, I don't know what it is, but when I hear your music, it's speaking to me, bro. It's speaking to me, bro. Cause I was making songs like he was playing in the kitchen. He was whipping up the sauce. He was playing out in the kitchen. He was whipping up a boss. Pot of playing with that clay. Nanny mixing with the sauce. Nanny adding all the spices, remixing the boss. So I was really talking about the transformation, but the Lord was allowing me to use it in a way that drug dealers can hear it. And I was like, can I do that? Ah! But the Holy Spirit was using it. And that's why I knew I couldn't put God in a box. I knew that God can use anything and touch anybody. And I was seeing, you know, people, I was just seeing so many people get touched. I remember being in the green room, about to get on, you know, about to go minister, and a just drug dealer just kicked the door and this dude in the streets, he kicked the door and, and came in and, and the green room. I'm like, bro, how you getting here? And I knew he, he couldn't do nothing, but I'm like, he like, stop doing this. I'm like, bro, what you mean stop doing this? He like, stop doing this. You can't do this. I'm like, bro, what you mean, bro? He like, you can't keep pushing Jesus on people. I'm like, bro, I ain't seen you in years. Your music came on in my car. I'm like, he was convicted. And then um, he like he left instantly, gave me a whole bunch of waters and just left. Later on, I realized that the Lord just started changing his life. I seen him online and the Lord started changing him through my music. And I actually disciple him now. 
it was just like reaching like people like people would say you gotta go to church or you gotta like you know do it that way do it do it their way to do it you know what I mean um, I just and from there um, I started really connecting with so many people in the kingdom as far as music I started connecting with so many people and I never actually seek nobody out every relationship came to me I never was like hey bro let's do a song nothing like that because I felt like I had Holy Spirit I ain't need no features. I ain't need no, like, nobody jumping no track on me. I got Holy Spirit, like, whatever, like, feature, like, whatever you doing out there, that's what you're doing. I love it. We went souls, but, like, I don't need no feature. So a lot of a lot of heavy hitters in the kingdom, I would say heavy hitters because of, you know, the call of God on their life. Like, they really stepping into it. They started reaching out to me saying, hey, bro, like, like can, how can I help you? What can I help you with? And they started, you know, hey, come, come collab with me. And, you know, a lot of people started reaching out to me. A lot of different street big ministries started reaching out to me. And I was like, man, let's get it. And I was um so I started like really uh hitting the road when I'm in preaching and stuff like that through the whole COVID. I started really um going out baptizing people and you know, we was renting out um um getting permits at state uh, capitals and, and all over the country and in the middle of COVID, no masses on we was baptizing people down and you know, and baptizing people. I had started a Bible study with like two people and I'm like, man, I'm not. and that thing you know, while I'm traveling, I'm still being faithful over my Bible study. And after, you know, Bible study started growing. And after, you know, they started calling me pastor. I'm like, look, no, I'm not no pastor, bro. Like, I'm just your brother. I'm brother Lyle. Like, bro, you know what I mean? Don't call me pastor. No, I ain't doing that. They were like, well, we're growing and we're doing all this stuff and we need a pastor. And I'm like, listen, look, I'm your brother. I love y'all. Like, but uh, bro, I ain't no pastor. I ain't, that ain't, that ain't me. Like, I ain't, I, I ain't doing that. You ain't really had me in no tie, no suit. Like, you ain't really box me in. And, um. What happened was we started growing and growing and we put on events. We started putting on No Flesh One and it was crazy. God started moving. Holy Spirit just moved crazy. We glorified the name of Jesus. We did No Flesh Two. And then um, everybody's still trying to call me pastor. I'm like, don't call me pastor. And then it took this, I'm, I'm coming in my house, I'm going up my elevator and there's this drunk young boy with a fifth of Hennessy in his hand. And he looked at me. I got two chains on. I got, I'm looking like a drug dealer. And he looked at me, he was like, you're a pastor. <laughs> and I just started laughing. And I said, what would you just say? He said, you're a pastor. I was like, man, that's too good. And I knew it was the Lord. And I was like, all right, bet. And then I, when people started calling me pastor, I, I, I didn't like push back on it no more. I just kind of like started like gradually allowing people to call me pastor. And it was a struggle for me. So I actually passed a, um, a ministry. Like, we just disciple people. Like, we don't do, like, we, we don't do stuff like, you know, a lot of uh, churches do. We kind of, like, just really do life like a family. And we disciple people. We really help people um, to actually obey and live out Christ and, like, hold them accountable. And we keep a lot of stuff going on five days a week. We got Bible studies. We teach. And we consistently just raising up, you know what I mean, people to actually walk out and live out Christ. And even um, helping them to be able to find out who who they are and their gifts, so that we can like um, find out how to actually get them uh, excelling in them areas, so that they can you know uh, win more souls. You know what I mean? So it's crazy, right? <laughs> Aaron, what do you have to say to those people who maybe are finding themselves in the streets or in that rapper or that drug dealing lifestyle? What would you say to them? Well, the first thing I would say is, um, I wish somebody would have told me like would have sat me down and really said, man, like, bro, you're responsible for a lot of people losing their life. You're, the, you're, the, you're, the, you're responsible um, for us not being able to eat because my mother spent her last money on getting some drugs. My my baby sister or my little brother couldn't eat because they spend their, we spend our money, last bit of money with you. Like, you see my life, you know my life. Like, this ain't, this ain't no cut cards. You know exactly what I've been, you know who I was. And you knew what the streets might, you know, say, you, you knew what the streets would say I was about. Something happened to me. And his name is Jesus. Now I would tell you, like, bro, or sis, or whoever, taste and see how good he is. Like, come to know him personally for yourself. Like, he'll change your life like he changed mine. Every day you wake up is another opportunity. Mercy woke you up. He woke you up for one reason, to glorify his name, to know him personally. You still got a chance today. What would you specifically say to people who are scared of being vulnerable, like in their music for the Lord, expressing how much they love him or how good he's been uh, when what's mainstream and popular is talking about girls and sex and drugs? I will honestly say, 
You got to understand that God only made, he made you and he broke the mold when he made you. So he created you distinctively different for a purpose and a reason for his glory. When you're talking about like, ain't nobody going to ever be you. You got to be comfortable with being exactly who you are. Because when you think about like God Almighty coming to die for you and he, he, he straight, like actually feeling the pain, actually feeling what it's like to be a man, getting whipped, spit on all these type of things so he can redeem you. And you can't and you want to be able to hold back anything. You, you, you can't you can't hold that back. You can't. It's almost like you you really like playing with this thing in the sense of like you a fear of man is in it to the point where it's though you actually making music that's going to get burned up at the judgment seat. So what happened is what you doing for him, if you ain't doing it for him, it ain't going to make it. It ain't going to make it. It won't, it won't, it won't, you won't get no reward for it. So you might as well reposition your heart and, and, and spend quality time with him so that you can see yourself in a better way. Because if you don't, all you're going to be doing is trying to please people and you still won't be fulfilled when he is the fulfillment. So I would tell people just to line up with who you are. Just be who you are. Can't no, ain't, nobody, ain't nobody looking for no fake imitators. You can only be who you are in Christ and let him express his life through you and just show your appreciation by making sure you're magnifying and glorifying. Amen. And Aaron, who is Jesus to you? Ah, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Colossians 3, 4, Christ is my life. He is my life. Um, he's my master. He's not just my savior, but he is my Lord. So whatever he says I do, he's my heartbeat, the reason why I'm here, the reason why I live, my joy, my peace, the, my, and my ambition, the reason why I get up and go and, and serious about doing what he called me to do. Um, He's truly my redeemer, like in every area of my life, when it comes down to my life, my wife, the things I get to do for him, whatever it's business or whatever it is, I get to do it all for him. So he's everything, everything. Aaron, do you have any last words for anyone watching? I got words for two different type of people. So the first people would be the Christian, the Christian. I know we pray this prayer and we believe that when we pray this prayer, that, that's just it. Like, I got my ticket. Or I got my, I'm not going to go to hell. Like, I'm going to go be with God. But I would say, honestly, a lot of times we depend on, like, you know, the Sunday or the pastor to preach this gospel and or preach whatever message they preaching. And we feel like because we feel good that he is good. But when you really think about what Jesus said, like, why you call me Lord, Lord, if you don't do what I say? He said he's looking for followers, followers. And ask yourself that question, are you really a follower? Because he even talked about people going, in that last day, people going to say, Lord, Lord, did not prophesy in your name, did not cast devils out of your name, did not work these miracles in your name, and he's going to say, get away from me. I never knew you. I never was intimate with you. You ain't put me first in your decisions. You ain't align your, your purposes with my will. You just did these things so that people can see that you can do them. I wasn't Lord. I was just, you get out of hell, card. Why would you want to be with me when you never was with me? Why would you want to enter into my rest and my kingdom when you wasn't really fo focused on the king? Why you want my benefits, but you don't want me? So I would say, you know, repentance is the most beautiful word that you can ever see. Repentance is a beautiful word. Don't look at it like John the Baptist. Even when he was saying, repent, that was love. That was love. I don't care how ugly he looked, how much dreadlocks, whatever he looked like. <laughs> that was love. So, yeah, I would say that to the believer. Make sure you really, you know, make sure you're really a disciple. Make sure you really operate in a sonship. And to the, uh, to the unbeliever, this is the things that we both know. The cars ain't fulfilling you. The houses ain't fulfilling you. The clothes ain't fulfilling you. Your life ain't being fulfilled. You almost feel like a fish out of water. You feel like a bird that can't fly. You know something is missing. I knew something was missing my whole life. I knew it. I knew it. I knew I was created for more. You know you created for more. But the thing, but the thing is, if a man don't have Jesus, a woman don't have Jesus, we self-destruct 
and we smash everything about everything about our life and we we live outside of our purpose and we just consistently keep going for more. And then when we about to die, we asking people for prayer. We asking people for all these different things. We want to start connecting to God. And you feel like you know something missing. So I would just say to any unbeliever, like, recognize like the biggest problem with mankind is sin. Us waking up every day for our own purpose. So because the biggest problem with mankind is sin, Jesus came to deal with that so that we can be back, right and right back in relationship with God the Father. He ain't just died so we can go to heaven. He died so we can be back in covenant and back in relationship with God the Father. You don't have that relationship with God. Don't deceive yourself by thinking that we can acknowledge him at times. God made, he made a way and he made a way through Christ Jesus. And that opportunity is right here for you today. Like you can have the Lord and the Lord can have you and you can be fulfilled in everything. I honestly can tell you right now, when I had my encounter with the Lord, I didn't have everything. I didn't have it all together. I felt like I had a trillion dollar check that I couldn't cash. I didn't understand what was going on with me. I felt like I everything, all this peace, all this joy, everything that you're missing. So I would say, I'm not going to say give Jesus a try. I'm going to say give him your life and follow him because you don't know what you're missing. 